hate to watch you leave without me. Well, it's not the quote of any romantic movie, it's exactly the feeling of two grounded astronauts who were forced to give up their seats for the stranded Starliner crew. This is obviously not unfathomable for astronauts who love space exploration more than anyone else. However, it must be a bitter pill to swallow when we admit that things would have been different if NASA had been more cautious in deciding whether the Boeing Starliner would take off that June. So how disappointed were those astronauts? How did NASA and the two astronauts trapped on the ISS react to this incident? Find out everything in today's TechMap episode. But before we begin, let's subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest space news. Back at home, we all have a lot of work to do, but from here, Earth sure looks like a perfect world. It's hard to hold back these words when you take your first glimpse outside the spacecraft under a historical mission, namely Polaris Dawn. This is not the first time billionaire Jared Isaacman has gone into space, but this is the first time he goes out of the capsule and directly sees our planet from space. Not only amateur astronauts like Isaac Mann, but also professional astronauts go through such intense emotions during their first time in space. Seeing our home against the blackness of space is a profound experience that leads to a greater appreciation for Earth and its apparent fragility, and a deep connection to humanity as a whole. Author and space philosopher Frank White calls this the overview effect. NASA astronaut Zena Cardman could have taken a chance to experience the overview effect this year if she had not been bumped from the Crew-9 mission. I think it was hard not to watch that rocket lift off without thinking, that's my rocket and that's my crew, Cardman said during NASA's live broadcast of Saturday's Crew-9 launch, as quoted by Space.com. It makes me feel very connected to this mission. Alongside Cardman, Stephanie Wilson was also intending to get a lift to the International Space Station on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft on September 28th. But thanks to Boeing's disastrous crewed test flight of its issues-laden Starliner spacecraft, the two women had to stay behind to make space for their stranded colleagues, Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams. The duo have been stuck on board the ISS since June and had to wave their Starliner ride goodbye as it made its re-entry without them in September. Wilson, speaking during the same broadcast, emphasized that astronauts are always working for the same team, no matter if they are in space or on the ground. We, of course, want to be together, she said of Crew 9. We have built friendship and camaraderie, but I'm very excited for them, Haig and Gorbanov, looking forward to hearing their stories from space. Luckier than Cardman and Wilson, NASA astronaut Nick Haig and cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov occupied two out of the four seats on board the Crew Dragon. Like Zena Cardman, cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov has also not flown to space. Therefore, Crew-9 marked the first space flight in his career. Earlier, he was a backup for Alexander Grebenkin, who was to travel to the orbital station with the Crew-8 mission. First in space and the only cosmonaut on the mission, Gorbanov could not hide his feelings of pride. Мне кажется, что когда человек выходит за пределы земной атмосферы, то он становится не только представителем своего государства или своей нации, но также представителем всего человечества. Больше занимаешься парапланеризмом, тем выше э, получается подняться на параплане. Соответственно, следующая ступень — космос, но без параплана. By contrast, Nick Haig has been on two trips to the ISS, while his unlucky colleague, Wilson, flew to space on board three space shuttle missions between 2006 and 2010. Although they had flown into space many times before, this did not mean that their love for space had faded. Astronauts love space because they are astronauts. This explains why both Zena Cardman and Stephanie Wilson felt lost watching Dragon take off without them. They are astronauts and they love space seems to be an immutable truth. Even though the microgravity environment in space is not a comfortable and safe environment for humans. Early in space missions, astronauts can disorientation, space motion sickness, and a loss of sense of direction, making completion of even basic tasks difficult. Nevertheless, according to some videos on YouTube showing real life in space, microgravity conditions are not very scary, are so fun instead. For example, you can play with your food without being afraid of them coming off. Space makes eating a lot more fun. You can turn your spoon upside down or even let it go and nothing's going to fall off. 
course, such exciting experiences tend to strongly stimulate the imagination and desires of those of us who stay on the ground. Someone even left a funny comment. My mom punished me several times for dropping water and breaking glasses. I want to live there. The other said, you can turn your spoon and the food won't come off. Me tries it with school food. Food doesn't come off. Well, I'm in space. In addition, from a professional perspective, many astronauts are driven by a desire to explore the unknown. Space represents the final frontier for humanity, and being part of missions that push the boundaries of what is known is exhilarating. The thrill of venturing into an environment that is completely alien to human experience is a powerful motivator for many. The true impact of the overview effect is significant. From space, astronauts see a world with no borders. They see the paper-thin atmosphere that protects everything on our planet. Around it is the deadly vacuum of space. Most who have been to space return to Earth wanting to protect it more than ever. The environment, the people, the ecosystems, Earth is all we have. Astronauts report how fragile our planet looks from above. They come home with a new mindset. Some channel this into activism or art. This is something that those of us who have never been to space can't fully understand. Even for those who have flown in space, it can be difficult to communicate the life changing experience. Nevertheless, the safety of the crew had to be prioritized. Cardman applauded NASA for prioritizing the safety of the crew and added that Williams and Wilmore were well-prepared professionals. The two stranded Starliner astronauts also said that they had no regrets about NASA's decision to extend their mission and to bring Starliner back to Earth without them, saying they had turned the page and were enjoying the transition to full-time space station astronauts. There's one thing that I try not to fret over, things that I can't control, Wilmore said, floating beside Williams in the station's Destiny Lab module. I'm not going to fret over it. There's no benefit to it at all. So my transition psychologically, maybe it wasn't instantaneous, but it was pretty close. If I can't affect it, if there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do. So we march forward, carry out the plan of the day. Williams agreed, saying, that's what we do. We're professionals. I have to say, though, in the back of my mind, you know, there's folks on the ground who had some plans, right? Like my family, to spend some time with my mom. And I think I was fretting more about that. The things that we had sort of all talked about for this fall and this winter, Williams said. But you know what? Everybody is on board and is supporting us while we're up here. So I think that fret went away real quick. We're here and we're going to be the best crewmates that we can be for our, for our space station crewmates up here. Also, NASA appears to have no regrets about its decision to return the Boeing capsule without astronauts on board. I think we made the right decision to not have Butch and Sunni on board, he said given the uncertainties at the time about the performance of the thrusters. It's awfully hard for the team, it's hard for me, to sit here and have a successful landing and be in that position. But it was a test flight and we didn't have confidence in the certainty of the thruster performance. It's true, the spacecraft's propulsion system, provided by Aerojet Rocketdyne, clearly did not work as intended during the flight. As Starliner approached the space station in June, five of 28 control thrusters on Starliner's service module failed, forcing Wilmore to take manual control control as ground teams sorted out the problem. Ground teams also detected four small helium leaks on Starliner's propulsion system soon after its launch, along with the one before launch. Although engineers recovered four of the five thrusters, this cannot able to convince NASA's decision makers that the same problem wouldn't reappear or get worse when Starliner returned. This shows the U.S. Space Agency's serious concerns about the performance of the Starliner's thruster. NASA is struggling with a big conundrum regarding Boeing's Starliner Calypso spacecraft. The International Space Station has just six years left before it is decommissioned. Meanwhile, Calypso, after 10 years of development, has not been eligible for being certified to fly six astronaut missions under the 2014 Commercial Crew Program. Of course, Boeing needs to complete all six of those missions to receive the full $4.2 billion contract value. The problem here is how to interleave six Boeing missions alongside the Dragon missions already booked for the remaining six years of the ISS. To make things more complicated, since the Starliner's crew flight test, NASA has not had any final answer for how best to achieve system certification. Should they proceed directly to the first operational Starliner flight or Starliner 1 despite thruster problems and helium leaks with the spacecraft? Or should they need another test flight which will cost Boeing more time and money? NASA's short term at present is to further delay Starliner 1 and continue to use SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. On its website, NASA has updated the 2025 Commercial Crew Plan, 
including NASA's SpaceX Crew-10 mission is targeting no earlier than February 2025. This timeline was previously for Starliner 1, but problems with the crew flight test mission delayed the mission from February to August 2025, moving up Crew-10 to February. This allows NASA and Boeing more time to review data from the CFT mission and make any changes to the spacecraft. Crew-11 in parallel with Starliner 1 for launch in that August 2025 slot ensuring that there are no gaps in crew rotation to the ISS, just in case Starliner 1 slips into 2026. The Post added that the spacecraft's next flight dates will be released after crew flight test lessons are incorporated into the aircraft, and NASA approves its operational readiness. The timing and configuration of Starliner's next flight will be determined once a better understanding of Boeing's path to system certification is established. This determination will include considerations for incorporating incorporating crew flight test lessons learned, approvals of final certification products, and operational readiness. Meanwhile, NASA is keeping options on the table for how best to achieve system certification, including windows of opportunity for a potential Starliner flight in 2025. We have no idea how will everything end up, but clearly the forward path is very hazy. Because the uncrewed spacecraft had a successful landing in its return journey in early September, wrapping up three months stranded in space, perhaps NASA engineers can convince themselves Starliner is good to go for crew rotation flights and helium leaks. However, that doesn't mean it will be able to complete all six crew rotation missions to the ISS. In fact, only three out of six missions are placed a firm order for a deliverable by NASA. The national agency has previously said it awards these task orders about two to three years prior to a mission's launch. As a result, Calypso can only carry out a maximum of three missions during the remaining six years years of the ISS. Of course, no way NASA will order more operational Starliner missions from Boeing beyond the three already on the books. And this is not just about time matter. Under the 2014 commercial crew contracts, NASA only pledged to buy at least two operational crew flights from each company and a maximum of six. For Dragon's case, the space agency broke the rule a little bit as they extended SpaceX's commercial crew contract to cover as many as 14 Dragon missions with astronauts. It's compulsory due due to the long-term delay on Starliner. Alternatively, NASA could decide to buy more Dragon missions and leave just a small portion for Starliner. We know that SpaceX and NASA are working to extend the lifespan of Crew Dragon from 5 to 15 missions. SpaceX is also building a fifth Crew Dragon right now, which is expected to come online next year. More Dragon missions, along with the handful of Starliner flights already on order, are enough to keep the ISS fully staffed through 2030 but still meet the goal of redundancy for crew transportation to the space station. Besides, if the troubled spacecraft can't fulfill the whole contract, NASA wouldn't have to pay the full $4.2 billion for Boeing. NASA awarded the company an initial $4.2 billion contract in 2014, and contract modifications since 2014 have added $400 million to the deal. So far, $2.7 billion has been paid out, while $1.9 billion remains to cover future service payments for operations operating flights. It remains unclear whether Boeing will receive the full remaining $1.9 billion, but we know that the company has reported a $1.6 billion loss on Starliner so far. This is certainly not good news for a company that is mired in scandal and heavy losses. This is why Boeing and other companies don't want fixed price contracts anymore. On fixed price contracts, doesn't matter how much they spent on the project, NASA is going to pay them the same amount. Not to mention all their other problems, for example, laying off 17,000 employees or 10% of its global workforce just now. As the company explained, to align with our financial reality and to a more focused set of priorities, workers probably hope it will not be the start of a trend especially as the Starliner program is facing the risk of cancellation. It has no doubt that if the company cannot continue to make money from the program, then that will be the inevitable consequence. Not unexpected to see that NASA will continue to use Crew Dragon for the foreseeable future. But such a shame that Boeing hasn't been able to provide an alternate solution to get people to space. More ironically, they have to rely on their rival to meet the requirements for certification. This reminds us of their arrogant attitude in December 2017, when Boeing's former CEO, Dennis Meilenberg, who was fired just two years later, said that the first person who set foot on Mars would get there on a Boeing rocket, beating 
Elon Musk's SpaceX. Now let's see what happened seven years later. In August, NASA announced that it would return the two astronauts who had gone to space via Boeing Starliner spacecraft. Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore via a SpaceX vehicle in February 2025. The Starliner spacecraft would return to Earth autonomously in early September, the agency said, citing its commitment to safety. Williams and Wilmore launched into space on June 5th aboard Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. Though the two were supposed to return in about eight days, technical issues identified with the spacecraft while docking delayed the return journey and later the agency decided to scrap bringing the astronauts back on the Boeing spacecraft altogether. This move by NASA is not surprising because Boeing's Calypso has been famous for its incompetence in spaceflight. Can you imagine while SpaceX Dragon has flown nine crewed missions so far, Boeing Starliner has not had any perfect test flight, not to mention being certified to ferry astronauts to the ISS? So why did a company that was once America's greatest end up so badly? Too many non-technical managers at Boeing SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk pointed out the biggest weakness in Boeing's operation. In 2022, he has opined about non-technical managers. I strongly believe that all managers in a technical area must be technically excellent. Managers in software must write great software, or it's like being a cavalry captain who can't ride a horse. He has a point. A technical manager generally oversees the development, implementation, and maintenance of technological company systems and processes, including troubleshooting any potential issues. Non-technical managers, on the other hand, tend to be focused on broader aspects of a company like strategic planning, communication, and decision-making. Elon Musk, for example, when the rocket concept started to grow in his mind, learned a lot about the fundamentals of rocket design and astrodynamics from reading books, but he also learned an incredible amount from those he initially hired and worked with when he started SpaceX. Not to mention, he also has a strong background in physics and engineering, which provided him with a solid foundation for understanding the principles of rocketry. And now he recognized himself as chief engineer of SpaceX. Even SpaceX's board of directors, although come from many different fields, also have working experience with Tesla Motors, PayPal, computer services company Netscape, and Impulse Space Propulsion. His recruitment criteria are completely valid, as evidenced by the fact that, after roughly 20 years, a unicorn like SpaceX can surpass the giants backed by politicians to become a titan in the space industry as today. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.